Well, I'm going to share with you this morning a message I recently shared with the youth. It's going to be tweaked a little bit, a little bit different. But um, uh, the title of the message is called, uh, What's in Your Monkey Trap? Not what's in your wallet, but what's in your or monkey trap. Or I'm going to teach you how to, how to build a monkey trap today. How many of you guys know how to build a monkey trap? Some of you youth should know how. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about how to build a monkey trap and find out what's in your monkey trap. So if you don't have the notes in the bulletin, if you could raise your hand and the ushers will get some of those. We should have some extras around there or maybe out in the foyer. Yeah, if you didn't get the notes, you can raise your hand and um, so you can follow along. But let's have a word of prayer together. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge your presence and uh, we ask that you would guide us into all truth, that you would illuminate the word of God to us, that you'd speak to us, let it hit the mark this morning. God, send your word out for the purpose that you have for it, let it accomplish the work, God, that you intended for it, and Lord, help us to leave differently. God, help us to be doers of your word. Lord, help us to be open and be able to receive what you have for us today. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before we get to the, uh, yeah, raise your hand if you would like a, uh, to, some notes to follow along with if you didn't get those. So before we get into the uh, monkey trap, uh, we're going to talk about God's main goal and main desires for your life. Okay. So what is God's main goal and desires for your life? You ever think about that? What God wants for you? What are his goals well, let's talk about just first what it's not. First of all, God's main desires and goals for you is not for your happiness, okay? It's not for your health. It's not for your wealth, your riches, or pleasure, okay? That is not God's main desire and goal for you. Now, this doesn't mean that God isn't concerned about these things. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want these things for you because he does. I mean... For my kids, I want my kids to be happy, right? I want them to be healthy. I want them to be well off. Um, but this is not God's main desire and goal for us. And so sometimes when these things don't happen, we get mad at God because we have wrong perceptions of who God is and what he wants for our life, right? If we're sick, if we have some health, um, health concern, or if we're not happy, or not having the money that we would like to have, sometimes we can get mad at God. And um, but we realize that, you know, that is not God's main goal and desire for you. That's not what he's trying to do. He's not trying to make you rich. He's not trying to make you happy and give you all the pleasure you want. His main goal, his main desire for your life is to make you just like Jesus. That's his main goal and priority in your life. That's what he's trying to accomplish in your life. Okay? is to make you just like Jesus. And this is confirmed in a couple of scriptures. Romans 8, 28 says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. What does that mean? Well, from all eternity, God knew you. Okay? And He has predetermined, He has predestined you to be like Jesus. Okay? That's His goal, His desire, is to conform you into the image of that you would be just like his son. And then in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In this verse, Paul is referencing to the Old Testament where Moses, who would go into the presence of God, and when he left, he would just be glowing. He'd be His face was radiating radiant with the presence of God. And so he had to put a veil over his face because um, it was hard to look at. And so it says here, you know, um, we're not like that. We don't have veils over our faces, but we do reflect the Lord's glory, right, in our, in our faces. And um, it says we are being transformed into his likeness with an ever-increasing glory. See, the, the glory that Moses had on his face didn't last. It decreased. It went went away eventually. But for us, it says here that it's, it's an ever-increasing glory um, in our faces in reflecting the Lord's glory. 
and uh, being made into his likeness, being made into his likeness. And it says it comes from the Lord. That's the best part about this whole thing. It doesn't come by your striving, your struggling, your hard work. It says this ever-increasing glory, uh, this transformation into his likeness. It says it comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So this transformation process comes from the Holy Spirit. That's good news, right? You can't do it. But you know what? The Holy Spirit can't do it without your cooperation. Because we can resist the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can disobey the Holy Spirit, right? We can resist that transformation process, and it won't happen. So He's not going to do it without your yielding to Him and surrendering to Him and working with Him. So what we need to ask is, uh, you know, since the goal is for us to be like Jesus, we need to ask, so what is Jesus like? Okay, We need to have a biblical view of Jesus. Because if your view of Jesus is messed up in pursuing Christ, it's going to be messed up. So we need to know, what is Jesus like, since that's our goal? Well, He's loving, right? He's compassionate. He's patient, he's kind, he's merciful, he's gracious, all these good things. But he's also very holy, right? He's perfectly holy, he's pure, and he's just. Okay? We need to keep that balance. And Jesus is more than these things. But, you know, how do we find out what Jesus is like? Well, reading the Word of God, spending time in his presence. So we need to ask ourselves, so we know when we get a picture of what Jesus is like, since we're being conformed into his images and his likeness, we need to ask the question, what are what are things in my heart that are not like Jesus? Right? If that's the goal, we need to look at our lives and say, um, what are some things in my heart that are not like Jesus? Could you shut off the water? I'm getting seasick. Actually, it's reminding me of camp. Uh, thank you. All right. So what are some things in my heart that are not like Jesus? These are things that we are. They're not things that we necessarily do or say. These are things that we are like uh, prideful, lustful, uh, selfishness, self-centered, you know, being bitter or angry, unforgiveness, Jealousy, envy, greed. So what is the Lord bringing to your mind? Maybe some main things that He's wanting to to deal with, right? To get out of your life. What are some things that are in your heart that are not like Jesus? And these are the difficult ones because, you know, there's some things we just, we can stop doing certain things, we can make some changes, but how do you get rid of pride? How do you get rid of selfishness, right? How do you get rid of some of these things that are in here and they're not so... Out there, you know, sometimes it's easier to deal with stuff that's out there rather than the stuff that's who we are. Only God can can do that. But we just need to acknowledge that and realize, you know, there's some things in my life that are not like Jesus. And then what are some things in my life, in my life that are not like Jesus? Now, these are things that we say or things that we do, right? So what are some things in your life that are not like Jesus? Could be lying. Might be gossip. Slander, could be cursing, stealing, cheating, uh, pornography, uh, sexual immorality, could be drunkenness, smoking. The, the list could go on, right? So what are some things in your life that are not like Jesus? And then the last question, what are, what are some things in my life that might not be God's best or God's will for me? What are some things in my life that might not be God's best or God's will for me? Okay? Now, this doesn't mean th- these things are sinful. These are things that might not necessarily be sinful, right? But in Hebrews 12, it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders. Everything that hinders. Okay? For me, um, in the past, there was a relationship that I had to get rid of. Uh, it was not God's will, and I tried to hold on to it. This was while I was in Bible college, and um, I knew it wasn't God's will, too. I just 
held on to it. And it caused me a lot of anxiety and depression. I just finally had to let go because it was just tearing me up. I just knew it wasn't God's will. It wasn't God's best for me. Now I have God's best for me right here. Angie Lewis. Uh, another thing for me that um, that I had to let go of was bodybuilding. I don't know if you can tell, but I used to be pretty buff. <laughs> <laughs> I was really into that in college and stuff, and um, it was an idol. You know, it's so self-focused, self-absorbed. You're just always thinking about yourself and how you look and what you're going to eat, what you're, when you're going to exercise, and it's just so self-absorbing. Uh, at least for me, it was, you know... Um, Playing guitar was another thing. I thought, oh, it would be really cool to learn to play guitar and lead worship and stuff. And I taught myself a little bit, and finally, you know, I just got this feeling like God was saying, you know what, that's not for you. So these are some things that were not God's best, his will for me. They weren't sinful. It's just not what God had for me. And I would miss out on some of the things that God wanted me to do. Golf was another one. I had this awesome set of golf clubs given to me. They were like, I don't know, twelve, thirteen hundred bucks um, when I worked at a sporting goods store. And um, that was another thing. God said, you know what? That's not for you. Now, that doesn't mean it's, it, it might be right for you, you know. But for me, it was like God was saying, you know what? This is not my will for you. It's not my best. It's not how I want you to be spending your time. So these questions we need to look at, since we're being transformed into the image of Jesus, what are the things that maybe maybe God is trying to get rid of in your life? What are the things that he's trying to get rid of in your heart, right? So, we can't do it on our own, but I want to talk about real quick just three ways that uh, how God works, how he changes us, and how the Bible actually describes that. There's three ways that the Bible describes this process of how he's changing us. There's probably more, but I just came up with uh, three of them. And these three are with the, they're manifestations of his love, okay? Just so I don't want you to get this picture of God that God is doing these things because, because he's angry or because he's mean or because he's being harsh. Okay? These are manifestations of God's love and his grace and his mercy, trying to get us conformed to the image of Jesus. And the first one is the fact that God, he prunes us. Okay? Three ways God works to change us. Number one, he prunes us. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 1 and 2, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off Every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that I will be even more fruitful. So the whole purpose of pruning is that so we'll be more fruitful. And to prune means to cut away that which is dead, unwanted, or unneeded. Okay? To cut away that which is dead, unwanted, or unneeded. So what are the things in your life that are dead or causing you death? Or maybe they're just not wanted by God, or they're not needed. They're unnecessary, right? We've got an apple tree in our backyard that I have to continually prune. Some of the branches are just dying, and um, so i got to climb up in the tree with a saw and cut these, these limbs off and try and prune this thing. Um, you know, what happens if you don't prune the tree or prune plants? It doesn't become as fruitful as it could be, right, as it should be. It's not as healthy, and it just looks bad. I mean, if you looked at our backyard with our apple tree uh, in the spring, there was just these huge dead branches, and it just kind of looked ugly. Um, so we need, to be, we need to be pruned. You know what? And God knows what he's doing when he prunes us. You can trust him. Um, it might be painful, though, right? When God start cutting, wants to cut things out of your life that you don't want to, um, it can be painful. So he prunes us. Another description the Bible gives is that he, number two on the back, is that he, he refines us. He refines us. In the book of Malachi, this was a prophecy about Jesus before, I think I don't, maybe four or five hundred years before he came. It says, uh, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. 
So it says that when Jesus comes, he's going to be like a refiner of silver. Do you guys know how they refine silver? Yeah, they got to get you got to heat that thing up extremely, extremely hot. Okay, and what happens is the impurities float to the top, and then they just kind of skim it off, and they keep doing that. The impurities will keep rising to the top, and until you have pure silver or pure gold, and so it takes some extreme heat to refine something, to refine um, silver and gold. And so when things heat up in your life, sometimes things come to the surface that you didn't even know were there, right? When difficult situations come, when stress comes or different things come in your life, some of the, some of the impurities, some of the things that you didn't even know were in your heart maybe come out. You're like, man, that is ugly. Well, God wants to get that stuff up to the surface where he can just skim it off and take it away. Because okay? you can't do it. You can't, but God can. He knows how to refine you. You know, it says that he's going he's gonna to purify, when he comes, he's going to purify the Levites. Who are the Levites? Yeah, they were the priests. They were the priests. And so in the New Testament, who are the priests? That's us. We are the, the Levites. We are the priests. In the New Testament, it says that believers, we are a holy priesthood. And so it's speaking about us, that he will purify us and refine them like gold and silver. And so to refine means to remove impurities or unwanted elements. To improve by making small changes. So God wants to remove the impurities from our lives, from our hearts. Remove unwanted elements and make small changes. I'm glad that God doesn't do it all at once, right? Sometimes he does like to do, make some big changes, and sometimes those can really hurt. But, you know, this heat can be painful, right? And when you start to see these, uh, these things come to the surface, it can sometimes be a not very pleasant experience, right? But this, again, is a, it's a manifestation of God's love. The, re, the pruning, the refining, it's, a, it's an extension of God's love. It's a manifestation of God's love. He's not doing it in anger or hatred or anger. He's doing it out of love. And the next one is the fact that he disciplines us. He disciplines us. You know, the scripture says that God disciplines those he loves. How many of you guys want God to love you? All right, how many of you guys want God to discipline you? All right, well, he's gonna, right? God disciplines those he loves. If you want his love, then you should want his discipline in your life. In Hebrews 12, it says, uh, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. Why does God discipline us? That we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Okay? Does God ever bring painful things into your life? This scripture says he does. God disciplines us for our good, right? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Okay, There's some people who uh, God tries to discipline them, and they just choose not to be trained by it. They choose not to learn from it. Well, God is trying to teach them, and they miss out on it. They miss out on the harvest of righteousness and peace. Okay? And that's the purpose of God's discipline. Righteousness and peace. To share in His holiness. God disciplines those He loves. You know, parents discipline their kids, you know, when they see something that they don't like um, or something that shouldn't be there. And they do it because they love, the, they love their kids. And I want my kids to look like Jesus. And so I'm going to, if there's stuff in there that really doesn't look like Jesus, I'm going to discipline them in love to try and help them in that process of becoming like Jesus. God uses parents, right? So God disciplines us um, as a loving parent would. And sometimes it's painful. How many of you guys have ever experienced some painful stuff with God disciplining you? Yeah. 
Sometimes it's not pleasant. But again, this is a manifestation of God's love. God disciplines those He loves. Okay? So, don't see it as this angry uh, God who's just wanting to pound on you. It's love. He's disciplining you in love. So, what does God use to prune, refine, and discipline us? What does God use? Well, He uses His Word, right? This Word refines us. It prunes us. It disciplines us. He uses other people, right? He uses other people. He might use your parents. He might use uh, your friends. He might use a pastor. He uses other people. He also uses His love and His presence. You know, just being, receiving His love can be transforming. Being in His presence can be transforming. He also uses circumstances. I forgot to put some Scripture verses up there. Isaiah 48.10. That is... Let me just read that real quick. Isaiah 48, verse 10. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Hmm. God uses affliction. How many of you guys have ever been tested in the furnace of affliction? Yeah, God uses affliction. Hebrews twelve seven. is part of the uh, passage on Scripture. Hebrews 12, 7 says to endure hardship as discipline. So hardship is something that God uses. He says to endure hardship as discipline. Sometimes when you're enduring hardship, it's discipline. It could be discipline from the Lord. Okay, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons or children of God. And then Romans 5, 3 and 4 um, I'm not going to look that up, but it says that uh, we should also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, right? And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. And so God uses lots of different things, but many times and most of the time he uses things like suffering, right? Affliction, uh, hardships to prune us, to refine us, to discipline us. He uses other things, but when you read the Scriptures, a lot of times it says that He uses difficult situations to mold and to shape us and to make us like Jesus. So, God is trying to make us more and more like Jesus every day. But we have a choice, don't we? We have a choice. We can choose to cling to Or let go of the things that God is trying to cleanse us of. We have a choice. We can cling to or let go of the things that God is trying to cleanse us of. If you read through the Old Testament, God was trying to cleanse Israel continually. But there's verses that talk about that say the refining goes on in vain. This refining process that God is trying to do, he says, it just goes on in vain. Because they're not cleansed, they're not purified, they're not refined. I'm trying to refine them. They don't want anything to do with it. He says, I tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleansed. Israel resisted God's discipline, His refining. They resisted Him. Then it got really bad. (laughs) So we have a choice, right? We can cling to or we can let go. So I'm going to teach you how to trap a monkey real quick. Uh, I got a quick video. Um... You can show that YouTube video. It's about a little over a minute long. It says how to, uh, how to trap a monkey. He laboriously Go ahead. Fills a hole you can turn volume up. When he is sure a baboon is watching him because he knows baboons are incurably inquisitive. Next, he puts some wild melon seeds into the hole and works them in so that they drop into a hollow. Then he saunters off knowing the baboon is burning with curiosity. The baboon doesn't trust that human being at all, so he plays it cool. 
but he's dying to know what gives in that confounded hole. Finally, Mr. Inquisitive can't take it any longer. He's got to know what's in there. He reaches in, grabs a fistful, and now his hand's too big to come out. If he had the sense to drop the seed, he could free his hand. Now he lets go when it's too late. First, he laboriously drills a hole in a giant... Now he's going to be lunch. When he is sure of no. Food. All right. You're turn the lights on and put that, uh, that picture up. So... There's many different ways you can uh, trap a monkey. One of them is how you just saw, but one of the other ways is they take um, coconuts and they'll make a hole in it just enough, big enough for his fist to get in. They'll put like they'll put an orange in there, and so the monkey will put his hand in there. And he, he can't pull it out, and he will not let go. And so, a lot of times they'll tie the coconut onto a tree. But that monkey, for his life, will not let go. He won't let go. And that's like some of you and me sometimes, right? There's actually a definition for a monkey trap, several definitions, but one of them is a clever trap of any sort that owes its success to the ineptitude or gullibility of the victim. I had to look up ineptitude because I wasn't sure what that meant, but it means lack of skill, ability, competence, or basically means being slow. You just don't get it. Slow. Uh, and gullibility, of course, means to be easily persuaded or easily deceived. That can be a description of you and me, right? A monkey trap. So what's in your monkey trap? What are you holding on to? That God is trying to get rid of out of your life. He's trying to prune. He's trying to refine. He's trying to discipline you. Let go of this thing. It's going to kill you, Right? It's going to cost you something, maybe even your life. There's a scripture verse in Jonah 2.8 that kind of sums it up. And it says that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. This is a huge, this is a key verse. Those who cling, you know, they won't let go. They're holding tightly to worthless idols. An idol is something that we put before God or um, something that we won't let God get rid of our lives. We're just holding on to that thing. Those who cling to worthless idols, they forfeit. What does that mean? To give up or you lose out on? What do we what do we give up or lose out on? The grace that could be ours. What is grace? Grace is God's enabling power, right? It's God's enabling power to help us. And so when we are clinging to whatever it is, this this worthless idol, we forfeit, we give up. We miss out on God's enabling power to help us get rid of that thing. What are you clinging to? What is it that you won't let go? Like that picture up there, I'm not letting go. The things we mentioned earlier, is it, is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Is it some sin? Is it something that is just not God's will for your life? It may not even be sinful. It might be just something, you know what, God's saying, you know what, this is not for you or it's not the timing. But when you cling to that thing, you forfeit or you give up. You miss out on God's enabling power to actually help you. And so if you let go, God's power, God's grace is going to be there to help you overcome whatever this, this is you're holding on to, that God is trying to free you of. You can be free. You just got to let go, right? You got to let go. You know, sometimes sin in the world can look like a nice Christmas present. Who likes Christmas presents? Yeah. And uh, you just reach your hand in there, and man, this kind of feels good. It's kind of nice. Same same thing. I, I can't get my hand out. I've got a hold on this thing that's in the world, and I just I can't get it out. And with sin, you know, sometimes, man, this looks nice. Let's see what this is all about. Oh. Sometimes we look this stupid. 
holding on to stuff that we just will not let go. And then, you know what? We can't receive what God has for us. We can't be used by God. We've got these, we're stuck, right? But if you guys would just let go, sin, the world, or something in your life that is just not God's plan for you. It's not God's will. It's not God's timing. He's got something better. God's grace is going to be there. His enabling power is going to be there to help you. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. So, what's in your monkey trap? Right? What are you, what are you clinging to? What won't you let go of that God is trying to refine you, trying to prune, trying to get out of your life to make you like Jesus? Let go. Let go. Let's stand. We'll close in prayer. But I guess someone on the keyboard or guitar or something would be great. Lord, I pray this morning that you would bring to each heart and mind those things that are in our monkey trap, God, the things that we are just clinging to that we will not let go. God, help us to, to trust you enough to just let go. Help us to let go and receive your grace, your enabling power to help us to overcome these things in our life and to be made more like Jesus. God, show us the things in our lives, God, that you want out, that you want to get rid of, even if they're not sinful. God, help us just to let go. I get this picture of someone on a roller coaster, you know. How many of you guys are, when you ride a roller coaster, you're one of those people that just holds on tight, going down the steep hill, and you're just clinging to the bar in front of you, and you won't let go? You know what? You need to be like the people who have the freedom. Just let go, lift your hands up. Man, you're missing out on the exhilaration, right? It's awesome when you get your hands up in the air on a roller coaster. Some of you are like those who are just kind of clinging to the bar. You're not experiencing the joy of letting go. So God has something more. So if you need prayer today to let go and experience God's grace, I just want to encourage you to come up, and we would love to pray for you. We'll have somebody to pray for you up here. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your enabling power, your grace, God, to help us become more like Jesus. God, thank you that you are transforming us by the Holy Spirit. God, help us to work with him and not against him, Lord. We just let go right now. We choose to let go of everything that is not of you, that is not your will. And we thank you, God, for helping us. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.